Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Verse 1 says this, These are the Proverbs of Solomon, David's son, king of Israel. Their purpose, so the purpose of these Proverbs, is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. So that's why he wrote the book of Proverbs. Here's another reason. Their purpose is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives. Would anybody like to live a successful life? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, God bless you. All right. Teach people to live a disciplined and successful life to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to the Proverbs and become even wiser. Let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring the meaning in these proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. Did you see the simple, the young, the wise? Everybody can learn from the proverbs, and that's why they were written. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you would help us to listen today, to hear what it is that you're trying to say to us through your servant Solomon, and Lord, through your Holy Spirit today as, as he takes the words of Solomon and the other writers of, the, uh, of your word and, and penetrates our hearts, God. I pray that you would show us the areas of our lives that are deficient, the areas of our ways that, that we can receive instruction more wisely. And God, I just pray that you would help us to be, more than anything, help us to be doers of your word and not just hearers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, look, in the last four weeks, we have um, we've explored the book of Proverbs, and we've kind of we kind of dived in to discover uh, what it has to say about fools and foolishness, and it has a lot to say about fools and foolishness. And we've just scratched the surface. I mean, we could take three or four of these every week and explore those things that that Proverbs talks about being foolish, and and it take us another month or two just to get through the book of Proverbs. So it has a bunch. But I hope these four messages, the foolish, t foolish thoughts, foolish tongues, foolish temperaments, and then foolish temptations last week, I hope they've been both a blessing and a challenge in your life the way they have been for me as well. But before we leave the subject of foolishness in, in the book of Proverbs, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of the book and let's talk about purpose. The purpose of the book of Proverbs is what we just read. And the purpose is not to point out foolishness as much as it is to highlight wisdom. It's not just to tell people how foolish they are, but to show people how to live wisely. Solomon said he wanted to teach his son to be wise. And he said that in the passage that we just read. He said the purpose is to teach people wisdom. Sometimes you have to point out foolishness before somebody is open to hear about wisdom. And so that's what Solomon did. But he outlines some benefits of wisdom. And, and I also wanna, I want you to see those. He said that he wants people to live disciplined and successful lives. He wants people to make good decisions. He wants people to be blessed. I mean, what father doesn't want to see that for his children, right? You want to see your kids make good decisions and be successful and be disciplined and to be blessed. And, and as a, a spiritual father, that's one of the roles of a pastor, is as a spiritual father, I want the same thing for you. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be wise. I want you to live disciplined and successful lives. I want you to see the fulfillment of, of God's plan in your life. But you can't get there with foolishness. You only get there with wisdom. So I want you to see how important wisdom is. He says this, Solomon says this again just a few chapters later in, in chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Look at the importance he places on wisdom. Solomon said, my father, David, taught me this. Take my words to heart. Follow my commands and you'll live. Look at this. Get wisdom. Get it. 
That's what, that's what Solomon, that's what David told to Solomon, what Solomon says to us. Go get some wisdom. Develop good judgment. Don't forget my words and don't turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom for she will protect you. In the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified or portrayed as a woman. So he's saying you find her and she'll protect you. Love her and she'll guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. You see how important he says that wisdom is? Some translations say this way. They say, above all, above everything, in all of your getting, get wisdom. Nothing, nothing is more important in your life than wisdom. So you can live wisely or you can live foolishly, but you can't do both. You can't do both at the same time. They are opposites of each other. And this entire book of the Bible was given to us to make the difference between foolishness and wisdom clear. That's why he gave it to us. So today I want to talk about foolproofing your life. Foolproofing your life. And I want to talk about how to get wisdom operating in your life so that you don't have to fall into foolishness. So if wisdom is a river of life, and I think I can, I can show you that in the, in the scriptures, but if wisdom is a river of life that, that blesses you, then today I want to point out three streams, three streams that come together to form that river of wisdom in your life. And the more you release these streams, into your life, the better off you'll be, and the, and the less likely you are to fall into foolishness. So let's figure out how to, how to proof, foolproof our lives. Here's the first thing. Watch your influences. Watch your influences. If you want to live a, a life that's wise, a, a, a life that is foolproof, then watch your influences. Here's a couple of scriptures I want to tell you about. In Proverbs 13 and 20, it says this. Walk with wise, walk with the wise, and become wise. Associate with fools and get into trouble. Walk with wise, and you'll be wise. You walk with fools, that's what's going to happen. Now look in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul said, don't be fooled by those who say such things because bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Now, news broke this week, I don't know if you, if you paid attention to this, but news broke this week uh, that there is a new professional football team coming to Atlanta, and the, the, uh, the offensive coordinator is going to be Michael Vick. He's coming back to Atlanta football. Now, if you don't remember Michael Vick, then um, he was the Falcons quarterback, the NFL quarterback, who went to jail a number of years ago for his role in an interstate dogfighting ring. And now, if there has ever been a cautionary tale about what not to do, I mean about who not to be, not how, how not to conduct yourself, it was Michael Vick. I mean, huge contract, product endorsements, just millions of dollars of product endorsements, incredible, almost boundless talent, um, team support, loved him, the owners loved him, everybody loved him. And every opportunity for success that you could ask for was given to Michael Vick. But he went to jail... When he went to jail, he was $17 million in debt, had no job, had no money, had nobody around him, and nobody to blame but himself. But something changed in Michael Vick while he was in jail. He came out of prison, and he was able to go back to the NFL for a few years, did some good stuff, won a few games, behaved himself, apprised himself very well, spoke very well for himself. He, he told the bankruptcy court, went to bankruptcy court, because when you $17.4 million in debt and you don't have a job, that's the definition of bankrupt. So he went to the court. It don't get more bankrupter than that. So he went to the court and said... I don't want you to wipe my debt away. You, you realize that they, they could have, with the stroke of a pen, wiped away his debt, and he would have been free of it. He said, I borrowed that money. I told them I would pay it back. I'm going to pay it back. 
And so he went to work. He, got, he went back to the NFL. He got some jobs as an NFL analyst on TV. He made money, and he took all his money to repay his, his debts. And the judge, it was, his, his mind was blown. He owed $17.4 million, and he paid back $17.2 million. The judge said, this never happens. I've never seen this happen. I've never seen anybody pay back that much money when I could have wiped it away. But Michael Vick said, no, I'm going to do the right thing. He's, he's volunteering now with animal rights organizations. And, and it's way past any, any benefit of PR. He's doing it now because he wants to and because he believes in that. Michael Vick changed. He went from a fool to a wise person. Now, the question is, what happened? How in the world, because you've seen, we've all seen fools just get more foolish, right? Just double down on stupid and completely wreck their lives. Michael Vick changed. It, 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 it begs the question, what happened? Now, I've read interviews with him, and not only did he discover or reconnect with his faith, but that time in prison forced him to separate from his influences, he had time to think about the people that were in his life. He realized that they were connecting him to a life that had gotten him in trouble. They, were, they weren't trying to be a good influence on him. They weren't trying to make him better. They were freeloading on him. They were yes men. They were telling him whatever they thought he wanted to hear so he'd keep them around, encouraging the worst in him. So he had to cut them away. He had, to, he had to find new influences. One of the biggest factors in him getting out of jail, getting a second chance in life, is that he changed his influences. And it's true in your life, and it's true in my life, too. Our influences make a huge difference in our lives. So let me ask you some questions. Well, who are your influences? Who is it that's influencing you? Who are the people that you spend time with? Who are the people you hang out with? Who's in your circle? I mean, depending on your personality type, you may have a huge circle of friends and influences, or you may have a really small one. But, but let, me get, let me get more pointed. What kind of people are in your circle? What kind of people do you spend time with? Are they encouraging you to be better? Or are they bringing out the worst in you? Are they keeping you connected to foolishness? Or are they encouraging you to live a life of wisdom? Look at the people who influence you the most. Listen, if you have to choose, you got A or B, everybody in your life, look at them and say, A, they're a fool, or B, they're wise. Which one are they? A or B? You say, well, look, John, look, calm down. I just hang out with them. It's not a big deal. I don't let them influence me. I just hang out with them. The Bible says, if you walk with wise people, you'll get wise. If you walk with fools, you're going to become one too. You say, John, listen, I, 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 seriously, I'm strong in my faith. I got this. I've got good character. My mama raised me right. You know, everything's good. I, I'm not going to let them rub off on me. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. So don't fall for the old, I got this. Don't fall for the old, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too strong to fall. Nobody is too strong to fall. If you surround yourself with fools, you're going to act foolish sooner or later. If you surround yourself with wise people, you will get wiser. It's just the way it works. And your influences are either going to make you more likely to be wise or less likely to be wise depending on who they are. But listen, influence is not just about who you physically, which people you physically spend time with. It's also about the people who, who get into your mind, the people that you listen to. Who do you listen to on talk radio? If you listen to talk radio. Who's, whose channel are you subscribed to on YouTube? You know, what podcast are you listening to? Who, who do you follow on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat? Who do you allow in your, te in your house through your TV? What's the underlying message of the music you're listening to? Is it encouraging you to be better or not? Listen, 
if you don't hear anything else about this point, hear this. Anyone or anything that has access to your mind is influencing you. Anyone or anything that has access to your mind, so in any gate it can get in, eyes, ears, whatever, if it can get into your mind, it is influencing you. And there are decades, there's decades of research to back that up if you don't believe me. If it's getting in, it's making, uh, it's making a change in your brain. Your influences are either, now, now, now think about this as a word picture, they're either going to scaffold you or they're going to stifle you. Your influences are either going to build you up, give you support as you reach higher and higher in your life, or they're going to hold you back. One or the other. So if you, if you want to be a wise person, if you want to shun foolishness, you want to be a, live a foolproof life, then you need to take a long, hard look at the people you spend time with, whether in person or through some sort of media. Okay? Ain't nobody happy about that. That's all right. Here we go. So number one, watch your influences. Number two, love instruction. Love instruction. And we're going to read a whole bunch of scriptures. The, the, Heather, bless her heart, putting all this stuff in, all these scriptures in. She said, you're quoting like the whole Bible today. So I, I pr pretty much am, yeah. So we're going we're gonna to show you the, this in the Scripture in just a second, but, but I, I, let's be honest for a second. This one's going to take some work, right? Loving instruction is going to take some work. This one does not come naturally for most people. For, for, one or, for really a couple of reasons. One, most people think they know best, right? You can say amen about your spouse. Nobody will know it's not you, okay? It, most people think they know best, and two, nobody likes to be told they're wrong. Nobody likes to be told they're wrong. So our pride a lot of times will keep us from learning to love instruction because we already think we got it, right? But a wise person learns to prioritize the decision over the discomfort. They would rather get it right than feel warm and fuzzy about getting it wrong. A wise person would, would rather get it right than do it themselves. So they humble themselves and learn to love instruction. Now instruction comes in two forms. Depends on what side of the action or the decision it comes on. So if you learn to ask for it before you act or before you make a decision, then it, it comes in the form of advice or counsel. And they, they try to help you make a better decision or take a better action. If you get instruction after you've already acted or after you've already made a decision, it comes in the form of constructive criticism or evaluation or in some cases discipline, depending on how bad out of whack things got. So if you, either way, if you accept it as a way to get better, a way to get wiser, then, then you value that instruction, whether it's before or after. If you take it personally, reject the counsel before you act, or reject the discipline or the evaluation after you've acted, then you're destined to repeat your mistakes and remain exactly as you are right now. Not improve, not get better. You're always going to be destined to be exactly as you are now. We have got to learn to value the input of other people. We've got to learn to love instruction. Now, this, I was fixing dinner this week, and our six-year-old comes into the kitchen, and he grabs a stool and hops up on it because he's too short to see the stove otherwise. So he hops up over there, and he observes for just a minute, and, and, he, and he watches, and then he looks at me and says, that's not how you make sloppy joes. I said, boy... And let me tell you, nothing good happens after boy. I'm just, that's the way it was in my daddy's house. I'd be a boy. So let me tell you something, boy. You ain't never made sloppy joes in your whole life. All six years, you've never made sloppy joes. Don't come in my kitchen and tell me how to make sloppy joes. I shoot that boy out like a chicken. I'm like, dude, get out of my kitchen, I told him. Now, he sat himself down in a few minutes and ate those things like they're the best things he ever seen in his life. I did it wrong, but it turned out all right, apparently. So, not everybody's advice should be accepted with equal weight. Okay? Just because somebody says it don't mean you have to listen to it. 
All right? So if you're trying to fix dinner, I wouldn't recommend seeking the counsel of a six-year-old. Um, ask somebody that knows what they're doing. Right? Seek wise counsel. Listen, if you're not good at point number one, if you're not good at, at having good influences, then you really need to pay attention to this. Don't just listen to whatever anybody says. Seek wise counsel. Be careful who you listen to. Because what did it say? If you walk with the wise, you'll get wise. If you walk with a bunch of dummies, guess what happens? Fill in the blank. Now, listen, honestly, it's uncomfortable to do this. It does not feel natural to do this, especially when you first start seeking input, when you first, when you first start learning to love instruction. Especially if you're a leader, you want to feel like you know what you're doing, right? You're like, oh, when you're a parent or you're, a, you're leading a group or, or in business, whatever, you, you, can, you want to feel like you know what you're doing. You, you want to feel like you have the answers. You want to be seen as the expert. But listen, if everything is about avoiding discomfort and saving face, you're never going to get any better. You're never going to grow as a leader. The only person who thinks you're supposed to know everything is you. Because everybody else already figured it out. They already figured out you don't know everything. Right? So they would appreciate it. On behalf of the persons who work with you, they would appreciate it if you would seek input about your decisions or admit when you don't know the answer so that you can go find the answer. Because nobody knows everything. Amen. I thought I'd get a lot of female enthusiasm about that. Nobody knows everything. Now, Pastor Craig Rochelle is a pastor that I've learned a lot from in terms of leadership. I listen to his podcast and, and, and I've learned a lot. And he says that they have really worked hard at his church to create a culture of feedback which means they evaluate everything, they talk about everything, they sort of put the events, they put the messages, they put everything in the center of the table and they talk about it. And they try to figure out how to make it better. And he said, he, he said I, I hope that there's nobody on my staff, no matter how long they've been here or how short they've been here, that, 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 that wouldn't mind coming into my office, that wouldn't feel comfortable coming in my office saying, Pastor, I'm not sure about this. Or, hey, I listened to your message today, and you know, I'm not sure this, was the, this is the best illustration that you're planning to use this week. You know, what about if you do this? Or, hey, I don't think that event went great. I think it could be better this way. Listen, that takes a lot of humility to be able to receive that from people. But the results are obvious. The man has the largest church in the United States, 27 campuses across the whole country, he, he's, doing, he's doing something right in terms of leadership, something that we can learn from, and, and, and it starts with being humble enough to listen to instruction. If you trust that the people around you love you and have your best interest at heart, and they have the, the same goal as to being the best you can be as a team for the kingdom of God, then you have to learn, listen, you have to learn to separate the do from the who. That's what they call it. They say we have to learn to separate the do from the who. We're not assessing ourselves as individuals. We're assessing what we do. So they've learned not to take it personally. You see, wisdom comes from experience and from perspective. And if you don't learn to listen to anybody else, then, then you'll only have your own experience and perspective to pull from, and that's going to limit you and destine you to learn everything the hard you know some people who have to learn everything the hard way? Have, we, have you been that person at some point in your life? Steve has, got no hair. Ran into that wall, probably what happened to me too. If, if you will learn to value instruction, you can learn from other people's successes and failures. Every lesson they've learned, you can you uh, will be at your disposal to figure out together. All of the collective wisdom of the people around you will help to inform your decisions and keep you from shipwrecking whatever it is that God has for you in your life. The more you can leverage the experiences and the perspectives of other people, the better off you are, and the more effective your work is going to be, your decision making is going to be, and I want to show it to you in the Word of God, okay? Here's the whole Bible starting, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 8. Proverbs 10 and verse 8. The wise are glad to be instructed. They want to hear. 
wisdom and instruction. But babbling fools fall flat on their faces. Verse 14, same chapter. Wise people treasure knowledge. Not only do they listen to it, they hold on to it. But the babbling of a fool invites disaster. Proverbs 12 and 15. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to other people. Proverbs 15 and 5. Only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Kids, when your parents try to tell you something, when they're in your house, you, when you're in their house, you need to listen to them. They love you. They're trying to help you because they probably made the same mistake that you're about to make. So whoever, uh, only a fool despises a parent's discipline. Whoever learns from correction is wise. And that's not just kids. That's adults too when they, when they get corrected by their bosses, by their pastors, by their leaders, by the whatever. Here's Proverbs 15 and 14. A wise person is hungry for knowledge. The fool feeds on trash. Hey, what do you read? What do you read? What do you fill your mind with? Are you learning from it or is it just fluff? Is it, are you learning how to be wise from what you're putting in your ears? Or is it just noise that's drowning out the voice of God who's trying to speak into your life? Amen. Proverbs 17 and 10. A single rebuke does more for, the, for a person of understanding than a hundred lashes on the back of a fool. All you have to, if somebody is truly wanting to learn, all you have to do is tell them one thing that they did wrong. They'll learn from it, they'll fix it, they'll change it, and they'll be better for the rest of their lives. You can beat the snot out of a, out of a stubborn fool and they'll never change a thing because they always think they're right. Now, please don't beat the snot out of a stubborn fool. I just need to say that so they don't get arrested. Proverbs 17, 24, sensible people keep their eyes glued on wisdom. A fool's eyes wander all over the earth. Proverbs 28, 26, those who trust their own insight are foolish. If you never go to somebody and say, this is what I'm thinking, but I just want to make sure then you are trusting your own insight all the time, and the Bible says you're foolish. Anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. Now look at this, in Hebrews 12 and 11, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. Right? We're in the South, right? Somebody, y'all have been disciplined before with a hickory or a belt or a paddle or a firm hand. Yeah, no discipline's enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful, and it's supposed to be. But afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. The root word for discipline is the same root word as disciple. The purpose of discipline is to teach, to educate. It's a form of instruction. So if you get disciplined and you choose to learn from it, then you get wiser. If you get disciplined and you choose not to learn from it, it's just punishment and all it does is make you bitter. But it's a choice that you get to make. It's a choice. Sometimes, sometimes you have, when it comes to decision making, sometimes you have to go with your gut. You have to go with what you feel like is best. Sometimes you have to make an executive decision and that's fine and sometimes that's good. But if you're always the smartest person in the room, if your ideas are always the ones you go with, then you are the biggest obstacle to growth in your company or in your business or in your department or in your ministry or in your family. And you are also hindering your own personal growth. A word to the wise. If you're not going to do what people suggest, stop asking for it. Stop asking for suggestions if you're not going to do it. It destroys morale, ruins your credibility. If you're going to be a dictator, just go ahead and start dictating. Just go ahead and do it. But don't waste their time and insult their intelligence by asking for input that you're never going to use. Amen, John. That's good stuff. Now, there's a better way. There's a better way. There's a way, there's a way to be wise. Learn to love instruction. No matter who it comes from, where it comes from, if you can learn from it, take it and be grateful. That's what a wise person does. Here's the last thing. We're pulling this train into the station. You need to, you need to watch your influences. You need to learn to love instruction, and you need to fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. 
I want to show you this in just a few places. Proverbs 1 and 7, this is kind of the one everybody knows. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of the beginning of wisdom and true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. That's not the only place it appears in the Bible. Job 28, 28. This is what he says to all humanity. The fear of the Lord is true wisdom. To forsake evil is real understanding. The psalmist said it as well in Psalm 111 and 10. For the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey His commandments will grow in wisdom. Praise Him forever. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One results in, ju in good judgment. And then Proverbs 15 and 33. Fear of the Lord teaches wisdom. Humility precedes honor. God will never honor a person who's proud and arrogant. Humility has to come before God ever honors a person. Now, do you see the connection in that scripture, in those scriptures between wisdom and the fear of the Lord? According to Solomon, whom the Bible says is the wisest man who ever lived, there is nothing more important than getting wisdom. And, the, and, and there's nothing more key to getting wisdom than the fear of the Lord. It is the very foundation of wisdom. It, it, wisdom is built upon it and contingent upon fearing the Lord. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? Is it to be so afraid of Him that you never interact with Him? What is the fear of the Lord? Well, it means to honor Him. It means to, to revere Him, have reverence for Him. It means to put Him in the highest place. It, 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 it's not so much about being afraid of Him, as much as it is to acknowledge He has supreme power, and He is true and holy and just and jealous. And that we need to honor that and revere that. So why should we put so much priority on honoring and revering and worshiping God if we're actually looking for wisdom? Why not just kind of dive in and try to learn stuff? Well, there's a number of reasons, uh, all of which revolve around this one understanding that God is the source of all wisdom. If you want to be wise, then you need to go to God. And I want to show it to you, first of all, because He created wisdom. Here's Proverbs chapter 8. The entire chapter is about wisdom personified as the wise woman. Listen as wisdom calls out. Hear as understanding raises her voice. And look at what she says. The Lord formed me, formed wisdom from the beginning before He created anything else. So wisdom was created by God. Now, look at this. He, not only did He create wisdom, but He gives it. He gives it to us. Now, I want you to see this. This is, a little, this is really interesting. Matthew chapter 10. This is usually used in a different context, but it applies here as well. Matthew 10, 40 and 41. Anyone who receives you receives me, and anyone who receives me receives the Father who sent me. Now, look at verse 41. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given what? The same reward as a prophet. You honor the prophet, you get a prophet's reward, right? As, a, as if you receive righteous people because of their righteousness, you'll be given a reward like theirs. So if you receive a prophet, you get what a prophet has. If you receive, what a, uh, you receive a righteous person, you get what a righteous person has. What happens if you receive God, the author and the creator of wisdom? You get His wisdom. When you receive Him, when you honor Him, you get this incredible gift of wisdom. So the fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom because He's the source of all wisdom. And when we honor Him and receive Him, we get to share in His wisdom. This is how Proverbs said it in, 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 verse, in, in verse 6 of chapter 2, For the Lord grants wisdom. He didn't just create it. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. Why else is, there, is the fear of the Lord connected to wisdom? Because He doesn't just give it, He gives it liberally. Look at James chapter 1 and verse 5. If any man lacks wisdom, if any of you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He will give it to you and He won't even rebuke you for asking for it. He, not only does, did He create it, not only does He give it, but He's not stingy with it. He'll pour it out in your life. And it's not just by reading and studying. It's not just by hearing instruction. He gives wisdom supernaturally sometimes. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
Verses 6 through 8, God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each one of us so we can help each other. To one person, he gives the ability to give wise advice. That's the gift of wisdom. And to another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. He will give wisdom as a gift from His Holy Spirit, not as a result of your experience or perspective, but a supernatural manifestation of God's power in the moment that you need it the most. He will just download it to you. You didn't think of it. Suddenly, you just know. You just know what you're supposed to do. What an incredible God we serve. And not only does he do it supernaturally, but many times he just does it instantly. I want to show you this in Luke chapter 12. This is what Jesus told the disciples. He said, and when you're brought to trial in the synagogues and before rulers and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what you need to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. So he, he said, look, now not only do I give it supernaturally, but I'll give it right there in the moment that you need it. When you find yourself in a delicate situation that, that, and you don't know what to say and you don't know what to do, just they kind of swept in and arrested you and now you're standing fighting for your life. He said the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom in that moment to diffuse the situation and to defend and advance the cause of Christ. It's an incredible gift from a generous God who gives us wisdom. There is no question that the fear of the Lord is connected to wisdom. So if you want to, if you want to be wise, then you have to learn to have a healthy fear of God. So John, how does that happen? What, what in the world does that even mean? Have fear of the Lord. You honor Him. You worship Him every chance you get. It means you follow His Word. It means you obey His voice. It means you accept His correction. It means you recognize His authority. It means you live with the understanding that one of these days, and it may be sooner than, we, than any of us think, we are going to stand before God and give an account for what we've done with the breath that He placed in our lungs. And once you have that understanding and you allow that to affect the way you live, it changes everything. It changes everything. It changes your priorities. It changes your motives. It changes your attitudes and your actions. It'll run foolishness right out of your life and invite wisdom in because we want to please our Father. When you, real, when you realize, you live with that understanding of who God is and the fact that we will stand before Him, then it'll cause you to invite wisdom to come in and sit down and you'll drink in everything she has to say in your life, even if it hurts your feelings, even if it makes you change everything that you're doing. You'll start appreciating the people that God have brought into your life, has brought into your life to help you and to push you, and to challenge you, and to teach you, and sometimes to rub you the wrong way. Because the older you get, or the wiser you get, the more you realize that sometimes it's the people that you enjoy the least that teaches you the most. God brings people into your life to rub you the wrong way, to chisel off some of that stuff that doesn't look like Him. So he can bring out his will in your life. When you learn to love instruction, it makes all the difference in the world. Listen, bad decisions are costly. Mistakes are painful. Foolishness makes life difficult. But wisdom is offered to us today. And if we'll learn, if we'll take it, we don't have to stay ignorant. We don't have to live foolishly. If we'll choose who and what we allow to influence us, if we'll learn to love instruction, no matter how much it hurts, if we'll learn to develop a healthy fear of the Lord, then we'll start seeing the blessing of God. We'll start getting the wisdom of God. We'll start experiencing the presence of God. And God will begin to move and operate in our lives. If we will, above everything else, get wisdom It'll change our lives. 
and we can ask him for it today. I want you to stand with me, please. Some of you are facing a decision that you don't know what to do. Some of you are just in a bad situation. You're like, I don't see a, I don't see a good choice. Y'all ever been there? Choice A, choice B, both bad. You're looking for C. Looking for C, none of the above. And sometimes life just doesn't give you one of those. So you're, you're asking God, let me encourage you. If you need wisdom, he said, if anybody needs wisdom, let him ask of God. So we're going to pray. And this altar is open for any reason, whatever you need prayer for. If you want to pray about your, your relationships, you want to pray about finances, you want to pray for healing in your body, whatever it is that you want to pray about, it's open. But if you'd like to respond to this message, then you can do that as well. You may need to ask God to help you break some bad influences. Stop listening to some people. Cut some people out of your life and, and invite some positive people in. Ask God for the wisdom to do that. And some of you need to be stop being so defensive and learn to receive instruction. And, and, and some of you need to, to live, ask God to help you live with a healthy fear of the Lord. So it changes everything.